Jesus said, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as Christ has loved us, we are to love one another. Beloved people of God, this is the day when Christ, our Passover lamb, surrendered himself to those who would kill him, setting us free from sin and death forever. This is the day when Christ, our teacher and Lord, knelt down to wash the disciples' feet, showing us how to love and serve one another. This is the day when Christ, the bread of heaven, shared a holy meal with his followers, offering a feast of abundant life and grace for all. Let us pray. O oh God, your love is embodied in Jesus Christ, who washed disciples' feet on the night of his betrayal. Wash us from the stain of sin, so that in hours of danger we may not fail, but follow your Son through every trial, and praise him always as Lord and Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.
friends, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sin, God, who is faithful and just, will hear our sin and cleanse us from every unrighteousness. Therefore, let us confess our sin before Almighty God. Eternal God, whose covenant with us is never broken, we confess that we fail to fulfill your will. Though you have bound yourself to us, we will not bind ourselves to you. In Jesus Christ, you serve us freely, but we refuse your love and withhold ourselves from others. We do not love you fully or love one another as you command. In your mercy, forgive and cleanse us. Lead us once again to your table and unite us to Christ, who is the bread of life and the vine from which we grow in grace. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our first scripture lesson comes from Exodus chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Listen for God's word. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall mark for you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell the whole congregation of Israel that on the tenth of this month, they are to take a lamb for each family, a lamb for each household. If a household is too small for a whole lamb, it shall join its closest neighbor in obtaining one. The lamb shall be divided in proportion to the number of people who eat of it. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a year old male. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of this month. Then the whole assembled congregation of Israel shall slaughter it at twilight. They shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and the lentil of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the lamb that same night. They shall eat it roasted over the fire with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled in water, but roast it over the fire, with its head, legs, and inner organs. You shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains till the morning you shall burn. This is how you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it hurriedly. It is the Passover of the Lord. For I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will strike down every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both human beings and animals. On all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. When I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. This day shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as the festival of the Lord throughout your generations. You shall observe it as a perpetual ordinance.
Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for the feet, but is entirely clean. And you are clean, though not all of you, for he knew who was to betray him. For this reason, he said, not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to the table, he said to them, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for that is what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done to you. Very truly, I tell you, servants are not greater than their master, nor are messengers greater than the one who sent them. You know these things. You are blessed if you do them. Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. If God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and as I said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Several years ago, a new buzzword entered the cultural and social sciences. That new phrase was paradigm shift. It first originated in the philosophy of science by physicist Thomas Kuhn in the 1970s, and he coined the phrase to describe a revolutionary and dramatic change in scientific assumptions. For example, the notion that the Earth rotated around the sun rather than the other way around required a paradigm 
paradigm shift. For centuries, people just assumed with Aristotle that the sun rotated around the earth until Galileo challenged that assumption with a new paradigm, a new blueprint for thinking about the earth and its relationship to other planets. Paradigm shifts are exciting, but they also upset people and make people really mad if they had stake their entire reputation on a particular way of thinking about things or doing things. Galileo challenged the church and turned the scientific world upside down in the 17th century. In his day, Jesus challenged the Jewish religious authorities and turned his world upside down. How did he do that? What did he do? The text before us on this Monday Thursday evening describes the paradigm shift that Jesus introduced to his disciples. The new example he set, that he commanded them to continue in his name. Now the portion we have heard skips the part about Judas, the betrayer, so that we can focus on what Jesus did and what he taught. It is important to note that what Jesus did and what he taught enclosed Judas's betrayal like bookends, as though the washing of the disciples' feet and the command to love one another as he had loved them had wrapped themselves around and swallowed the devastating hurt of Judas's action. None of the Gospels minces words about Judas or tries to hide the fact that one of Jesus' 12 closest friends on earth betrayed him. But only John's Gospel has him doing so after Jesus has washed his feet. The stage for this paradigm shift, this new example, is set by the foot washing. The enactment of this new example comes in Jesus' teaching to the 11 remaining disciples after Judas has departed. Jesus sealed his act of service in washing the disciples' feet with his command to love, with his embrace of betrayal as glorification and with his refusal to let Judas or any other authority or power on earth deny him the chance to prove his love for the world. The mandate to love in the face of betrayal remains the supreme example of turning the world upside down. It is the kind of paradigm shift that only needed to occur once because nothing could ever surpass it. Every generation wonders why Jesus did this, why God allowed him to do it, why God chose this brutal form of spiritual and physical sacrifice to redeem the world. Given the choice between doing something the easy way or doing it the hard way, what Jesus did certainly was the hard way. Why didn't God just wipe out the Roman army with a thunderbolt, destroy the Roman Empire, and let Jesus enjoy a long ministry? Why has God allowed scores of Christians, Jews, Muslims, and people of all kinds of religious faith to be persecuted and killed? Why isn't the world getting better? Where has love gotten us all these years? The answer is that God has chosen to partner with us rather than to act independently of us for reasons which I'm sure I don't understand. God has chosen to offer forgiveness and to continue appealing to us to come home. God's covenant with us is binding. God's steadfast love endures forever. God isn't the one with the problem. The great Jewish theologian and prophet Abraham Heschel used to say that we have no right to ask God, where were you 
when the Holocaust took place, or when Syrians were slaughtered in Aleppo, or while Ukrainians are being slaughtered in Mariupol and Bucha and Kiev. Rather, Heschel said, God should be asking us, where were you? Jesus' mandate that we love each other as he has loved us turned the world upside down and challenged every assumption about what it means to be a winner. There were people in the Greek cities where the Apostle Paul planted churches who thought Jesus must have been a loser to let himself be crucified. What kind of fool would submit to that without speaking up for himself? The answer was love. The kind of sacrificial love that insists that every human being, even the betrayers, are worth dying for. That kind of love still challenges every assumption about what it means to be a winner. To those who still wonder why God hasn't intervened on behalf of the innocent to abolish evil, the answer is, God has intervened. God broke into the world in the person of Christ who took on our flesh to live with us. In Christ, God set an example of how to extend the covenant to all humanity and to fulfill the kingdom of God, that those who believe may become the children of God. Let us pray. Holy One, now is the time in which Jesus is glorified, and you are glorified in him. Empower us to love as Jesus loved, so that everyone will know that we follow the way of Jesus Christ, our friend and Savior. Amen.
to Moses, this shall be a day of remembrance for you. You shall celebrate it as a festival of the Lord. Paul says to the church, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us lift our hearts in thanksgiving to the Lord our God. O Lord our God, our creator and the ruler of the universe, you made us in your image and freed us from the bonds of slavery. You claimed us as your people and made covenant to be our God. You fed us manna in the wilderness and brought us to a land flowing with milk and honey. When we forgot your covenant, you spoke through prophets, calling us to turn again to your ways. You are holy, O God of majesty, and blessed is Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. In humility he descends from your heights to kneel in obedience to God's commands. He who is boundless takes on the bondage of our sin. He who is free takes our place in death's prison. He who is risen leads us to eternal life. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving as a living and holy offering of ourselves that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Gracious God, pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these your gifts of bread and wine, that the bread we break and the cup we bless may be the communion of the body and blood of Christ. By your Spirit, unite us with the living Christ and with all who are baptized in his name, that we may be one in ministry in every place. As this bread is Christ's body for us, send us out to be the body of Christ in the world. Lead us, O God, by the power of your Spirit to live as love commands. Bound to Christ, set us free for joyful obedience and glad service. As Jesus gave his life for ours, help us to live our lives for others with humility and persistent courage. Give us strength to serve you faithfully until the promised day of resurrection, when, with the redeemed of all the ages, we will feast with you at your table in glory. Through Christ, all glory and honor are yours, almighty God, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. On the night of his rest, when he was at table with his disciples, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them and said, This is my body given for you. As often as you eat and take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Friends, as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we celebrate Christ's death and resurrection until he comes again in glory. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. I encourage you now to take, if it's a communion kit, that you take off the top layer and then take the wafer. If you prefer to partake of the bread, I ask that you pass the plate around to each other so that each may take a piece of the bread. 
Jesus said, the one who comes to me will never be hungry. This is the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. And if you have a communion kit, I invite you to take off the second layer to reveal the, the juice. And those that are partaking of the, with the carafe and the small cups, simply pour a little bit in. Go ahead and pass the carafe and the cups around to each other. Or you can have one person, and maybe an elder, at the table pour the cup for you. Jesus said, the one who believes in me will never be thirsty. This is the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. God of grace, we give you thanks for the feast of redemption we have shared in the body and blood of our Savior. As you have nourished us with love, let our lives proclaim your great love for the world. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Our closing hymn together, which is printed in your bulletin, Live in Charity, comes from the Taze community in France. It's an easy, somewhat repetitive piece that can be harmonized. <coughs> Tina will play it through first, the choir will then sing it for you, and then we will sing it together four times. <laughs> Thank you.